Now, speaking of free will, you explained that free will denial is very popular among neuroscientists and scientists today. Why do you think this belief is so common, and why do you believe it to be wrong? Well, I, I, it's a very, very interesting topic. It's interesting for scientific reasons. It's interesting for philosophical reasons, and it's interesting for psychosocial reasons. I, I, I hold the viewpoint that everyone believes in free will. Uh, that there, there really is no one who doesn't believe in free will. Uh, I don't think there's ever been a human being who's ever lived who who doesn't believe in free will. Um, the reason is that um, belief is not merely what you say you think, but belief is what you do. It's it's how you behave. For example, if you ask um, if you ask an embezzler, do you, do you believe in financial honesty? And he says, Sure, yeah, I definitely believe in that. Well, you know, he doesn't believe in that because he's an embezzler because he steals money. Um, so if a person who really did not believe in free will would have to stop living as if free will were true. And everybody lives like free will is true. Everybody feels mo that you can morally choose good or evil or that other people choose, morally choose good or evil. Everybody believes that they have some degree of genuine freedom in choosing. Uh, you couldn't live your life. You, you couldn't live your life as a meat robot. Um, and a, a good example, if, if you have someone who doesn't believe in free will, um, is to, if you see them working on their laptop, just take your cup of coffee and hold it over the, over, over the laptop and ask them, well, should I pour this coffee on your laptop? And of course, they'd say, no, don't do that. And you say, hey, I've got no free will. I've got no choice. You can't blame me if I do. I'm no more responsible for pouring a lap or for pouring the coffee than the coffee cup is. Uh, so the, re the reality is that everybody believes in free will. It's just there, there's some people who say they don't believe in free will. And what I, I think of it as, as uh, materialist signaling, actually, is the term I use. And it means that they believe in the ideology of materialism so radically that they try to convince other people of how pure they are in their materialist ideology. You know, well, I don't even believe in free will. But of course they believe in free will because they behave that way. So I'll, I will believe that they don't believe in free will when they stop acting like free will is real. Right, right. Yeah, and that sort of gets back to uh, the expectations I was talking about earlier. You know, what are the expectations? What do, would you expect? What behavior would you expect from someone who says there's no free will? You know, and does that match up to the reality of their actions? Sure, sure. I mean, most people who don't believe in free will are perfectly ethical people who be, who behave as, as, as they behave as if free will is real. In fact, some of them are are real moral scolds. I mean, you read some of the uh, some of the uh, 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 blogs of J Jerry Coyne, who who is a biologist who doesn't believe in free will. And I'd say probably 80% 80, 80 of his blog is taken up with various moral exhortations to, you know, to, to do this, to do that. Uh, but if you didn't believe in free will, then what's the sense of making moral arguments there? Because there is no morality. It's, 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 it's all just chemistry. And it's an easy way out to determinism. And uh, because yes. then you're not on the hook, you know, for much of anything. Right, right. And I, I suspect that that plays a deep role. It, it's kind of a way of saying all, all the all the bad parts of my life aren't really my fault anyway, so you can't blame me. Um, and it's it's kind of a cop out. Yeah. And then then it begs the question, what about the good parts of your life? Were those accidents, you know, or did you? They choose they, them? they still take credit for that. I, I you know, that's they, yeah. uh, you know, if they uh, and they 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 still take their paychecks. I mean, it's uh, you know, if if they didn't freely show up to work and so on, and if they didn't freely have good ideas, and why why would they expect to get paid? You know. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've written that nature is not a closed system, and that it's possible that ordinary scientific causes in nature can come from outside nature. You also hold that science alone cannot interpret what science has revealed about the human mind. Science cannot tell the whole story, in other words. And so you've drawn from philosophy and theology in your book to make a whole, complete argument. What have you learned personally from your study of ancient philosophers and theologians? I know you did a lot of additional research um, you know, for this book and also after you became a believer, uh, your journey from atheism to, to belief in God. Did you come across very old arguments that were consistent with your experience as a neurosurgeon? Sure. Um, the the ancient philosophers got a lot of things right, and uh, Aristotle and Plato and Thomas Aquinas, um, and 
basically, even the way we think as modern people in the West um, is structured in a lot of ways from, from the work of Plato and, and, and Aristotle and their followers. Um, and um, science can't explain everything, of course, um, and it can't even explain itself. That is, science is not a self-validating thing. If you define science as the systematic study of um, causes in the in the physical world, um, you can't validate the truth of science by science. You, you you have to take a philosophical approach to say whether science can or cannot explain things. So science isn't even self-validating, let alone a, a complete description of everything in the in the world. Um, to me, the, the the most compelling reason to believe that there is agency outside of the natural world that causes the natural world to exist and causes it to 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 change and to have the kind of natural laws we have. Uh, well, there there are two reasons. One is um, that modern science, particularly modern cosmology, um, uh, points us to the Big Bang. And the, the Big Bang is a cause that came from outside of the universe because the Big Bang itself was not in the universe because the Big Bang existed uh, at, at, at before the universe or as the universe began. So the Big Bang didn't come from the universe because the universe didn't exist before the Big Bang. So even basic cosmology points to causes that are outside of nature. Uh, the singularities that are at, at, at inside black holes are completely undefined according to natural science, meaning there is no way that natural science currently understood can understand what's inside that singularity. So science can handle things that are outside of the natural world. It does it all, all the time. Uh, the second reason to believe that there's something outside of the natural world goes back to Aristotle's argument for a prime mover. And what Aristotle argued, I'll, I'll say it can be expressed in a simple sentence, that you can't go to infinite regress in a series of instrumental causes. And what that means is that if you have one thing causing another thing, and the causation is instrumental, meaning the, the, the thing that, that causes the effect has to continue acting as, as the effect is caused, you can't go to infinite regress. You can't just keep going back further and further and further there has to be something at the beginning of the series of causes that is outside of that causal chain. And what Aristotle would say, what St. Thomas Aquinas said is, that is what all men call God. Uh, so God is not only very acceptable in scientific um, uh, reasoning, I think God is necessary in scientific reasoning. And um, I think God's existence is, um, is actually, in a, in a sense, a scientific theory in that you can compile evidence for his existence, I think it's the strongest theory in science. It's the most thoroughly proven theory in science. Hmm. Yeah, and I appreciate what you, you, you say about science there. But there was a time in your life, and we will explore that in a, a further episode, where you felt that science could explain everything, that, that it did have the answers. In fact, at one point in your, your life, you saw it as an escape, you know, as a, as a place to jump for truth and wisdom uh, when life you know, didn't make sense or wasn't as great as you, you hoped it would be. So we'll explore that and just your journey from atheism to belief in God as part of our next episode. Well, I hope that uh, this gives listeners, viewers, a little taste of what your book holds. We'll leave it there for now. But as I said, in a separate episode, we'll continue unpacking the insights you present in your new book. Dr. Agnora, I want to thank you for your time and uh, being able to, to chat with us today. Thank you, Andrew. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Well, you can learn more about the book and order your copy at theimmortalmind.org. That's the website, theimmortalmind.org. For ID the Future, I'm Andrew McDermott. Thanks for joining us. ID the Future, a podcast about evolution and intelligent design.